Well, good morning, brothers and sisters, young people. I am so excited to be talking about this subject, Christ coming in clouds. But it begins, it begins with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you just to imagine the time that Jesus had risen from the tomb had been many weeks now. Many things had passed by. And and for the disciples, it was no longer daring to believe that Jesus would rise. But now they firmly knew that he had risen from the dead. And it was one Sabbath that, that Jesus led his 12 disciples out from Jerusalem down into the Kidron Valley, past the Garden of Gethsemane, up the slopes of the Mount of Olives. And there they were, they, they stood there listening to the Lord Jesus Christ as he, as he gave them words of instruction, his last words before he departed. And can you imagine that scene? And, and that scene is so reminiscent, isn't it, of Elijah and Elisha. Elisha, the pupil of Elijah, And Elijah told Elisha that if Elisha saw him go up into heaven, then he would receive the double portion, the the sonship. And here now these twelve, they too would watch their master go up into heaven. And they too would receive sonship. They would become heirs, the apostles. And their mission would be to take the the still small voice of calm to the four corners of the earth. So let's just open up our Bibles this morning, brothers and sisters, and let's have a look at Acts chapter 1. And uh, this special day had arrived. Jesus would ascend to his Father, and there Jesus stood with the twelve. And I want you just to notice a little detail. It's always in the little details, isn't it? At the end of verse 12, it says that Jerusalem, where they stood on the Mount of Olives, was a Sabbath day's journey. I want you to notice that, a Sabbath day's journey. That's really, really important. According to tradition, a Sabbath day's journey was 2,000 cubits. So Luke is deliberately drawing our attention to the fact that where Jesus stood moments before he ascended into heaven and the city of the king, the city of the promises, the city that had rejected the Messiah was 2,000 cubits away. And surely then with this deliberate drawing of our attention by by Luke, surely there's, there's something being hinted here. And there is. Just remember, just remember how there were 2,000 cubits between the Ark of the Covenant and the people of God as they made their way into the Promised Land. And you can read of that if you're making notes, Joshua 3 verse 4. And we know in symbol that this Ark spoke of the Lord Jesus Christ and there would be 2,000 units, 2,000 years. He would be the first. And then many others would be ushered into glory. And so in other words then, I believe, I personally believe that what we're seeing here in Acts chapter 1 is a a kingdom scene. It's a kingdom scene. 2,000 cubits between the Ark and the Covenant and the people of God. 2,000 cubits between where Jesus stood with his 12 disciples and the city of Jerusalem that was in darkness. And they were the first to see Jesus ascend into heaven. And surely the exhortation is that in 2,000 years later, Jerusalem would see that glory. Jerusalem would see that glory. As Brother Johnny mentioned, isn't it an amazing privilege that here we have this kingdom seen, these 2,000 cubits, and we happen to be the generation living in the 2,000 cubits. We are the ones, brothers and sisters and young people, who are on the threshold of the kingdom. What a privilege, what an honour, what an opportunity we have. Let's seize that opportunity. Well, it's also quite interesting uh, to observe the way that Luke, mentioning these 2,000 cubits, the way that Luke um, highlights the way that that Jesus ascended into heaven. We've got the the phrases here on the screen, but they're interesting to, to notice. At the end of Luke, in Luke chapter 24 and verse 51, it says that Jesus was carried up into heaven. Very, very simple language. 
In Acts chapter 1, verse 9, it says he was taken up. In the chapter which we're looking at now, Acts 1, verse 9, he was taken up. And that means to lift up, to raise up. And in Acts 1, verse 10, he went up, which means to go, to depart. So if you look at those words, I know it's early in the morning to be doing this, but if you look at those words, it's telling you from Acts that Jesus physically went away up into heaven. There's a physical movement that's going on. But in Luke... Under the Spirit, Luke chooses a very different word. And there's a message being conveyed here. And that word, brothers and sisters, young people, is really interesting. Because when we look at that word, it relates to sacrifice. Acceptable sacrifice. I'm going to just show you a verse here. You all know it, but this is the way that this word is used. Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's for then he did once when he offered up himself for the that phrase there offer up and offered up himself is the same word there he went up or he was carried up in Luke 24 and verse 51 so what's that the message there well it's telling us that something momentous happened upon this mount it wasn't just simply that the Lord Jesus Christ ascended from this mount Something was finished. It was completed. And it rose as a sweet-smelling savour. I want you to imagine that. As the Lord Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, it was as if it were a sweet-smelling savour rising up into the nostrils of Almighty God. But it also tells us that a journey had finished. This journey, that the ministrations of the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the work that he had upon the earth was now finished upon this mount. And it's telling us that a The commencement of a new journey began. And I want you just to to plant those ideas in your mind. That as he leaves the Mount of Olives, of course he ascends into heaven. But it's a new journey. A new life for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was accepted by God. Now today, even the most powerful telescopes in space, like the Hubble telescope, Nothing has discovered heaven. And if you look, I've got on the screen here, the Andromeda galaxy, which is the the farthest object which is visible to the naked eye. I'm sure you've all seen pictures like that. You can actually see it on a a clear starry night. That's two and a half million light years away. So you have to travel for two and a half million years at the speed of light to get to our nearest galaxy. If you look at space... Scientists talk about observable universe. So if you look at the centre of the Earth to the outer perimeter of the observable universe, it's 46 billion light years. So, So the circumference of space, everything that we can see in a circle, is between 92 and 93 billion light years away. So you might be asking, because you're an intelligent audience, what is beyond the observable universe? I don't know. Nobody knows. Scientists don't know. Because the galaxies and the stars are so far away that the light will never reach us. Now let's think about God. Where does he abide? Surely, by by, by just simply thinking about these things, he lives, he dwells beyond the observable universe. Surely that's a a reasonable thing to think. That, That he's beyond his own creation. That he transcends the worlds that he built. This is almighty God. And Jesus is now, he's on his way to be with him. Just think of that. Just think of that. And so then surely we can only conclude one thing. That when the disciples there are on the mount and they see the the Lord Jesus Christ now, their master, ascending into heaven. Who is it for? It's not for Jesus. He's got a long way to go. It's for them. To make an impression upon them. To change their lives. But surely when the Lord Jesus Christ is out of sight, he was teleported to a fourth dimension. Now you might be thinking, fourth dimension? It's half past nine on a a Saturday morning? That's too much. Is it, brothers and sisters? It's not at all. It's not at all. Think of Jacob's ladder. The angels that ascended and descended from earth to heaven with God at the top. 
And surely then, the Lord Jesus Christ was transported to heaven in a similar way. There are the angels and they abide with Almighty God. Beyond all time, in the eternity of God. And they have the ability to return to this earth in any point in the human timeline. It's, it's extraordinary. It's beyond certainly a Saturday morning to think about. And so I want you to imagine then Jesus being lifted up into the clouds. And there the disciples are seeing him higher and higher until he's finally out of sight. And then we we read these well-known verses. Let's have a look at verse 10 of Acts chapter 1. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as Jesus went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing Up into heaven, this same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as we have, as ye have seen him go into heaven. And and, and surely we've all got a, a, a vivid picture of that. But I want to draw your attention to a word here. It says that Jesus was received into this cloud. I want just to look at that, please. It says that he was received. I believe there's a little clue here that that something's going on that's possibly behind or beyond our imagination here. That that word receive means to pick up from below, to carry upward. And and so then it, it, it's quite natural, isn't it, that this cloud came down and 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 gathered up Jesus. And picked him up and took him on his way. But it also means to receive hospitably, to welcome. So there's something about this cloud that welcomes the Lord Jesus Christ. That welcomes him. Do clouds do that? And escort him on his way. Well, what is this cloud? Well, perhaps it is the Shekinah glory, the the, the symbol of of God's presence, his power, his glory. The the, the very thing that covered the, the tabernacle and the temple. When we look at the transfiguration, it engulfed the Lord Jesus Christ. But I believe that this cloud was a cloud of angels. And think about this. If A multitude of the heavenly host sang glory to God at the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. What would they do when one who has overcome the world, when his work is now finished, he's now to ascend the Father in heaven. His journey is over and a new journey begins. Surely they would shout for joy. And I believe this is the welcoming of the angels that we have here. So we have two magnificent bookends. Just imagine that. We've got two magnificent bookends. At the beginning of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and at the conclusion of his life on earth. What do you have? You've got something very similar, haven't you? You've got an angel or angels narrating to shepherds and disciples. And then you've got a spectacular heavenly display of angels praising God. Have you ever thought about that, brothers and sisters, young people? It's absolutely marvellous. And these two angels, these two angels that stayed behind, that didn't escort Jesus Christ to heaven, who were they? Well, surely, we don't have to exercise our imaginations too much. Surely they were Gabriel and Michael. Gabriel, the one that spoke to Mary about the begotten son. The one who had taken on the role to preserve the seed. And Michael. The angel of God's people. The angel of his presence. Now I want to add some more picture. A colour and, and, and drama to this climactic picture that we're looking at. I want to have a look at an Old Testament prophecy. Can we have a look at Daniel chapter 7? You might be thinking um, it's not a natural connection to go to. But it is. Daniel chapter 7, and as we go here, the the connections with the scene that we've tried to paint in your minds will just jump out from the page. Let's have a look at verse 13 of Daniel chapter 7. 
So hear then that the drama of this vision, I saw in the night visions and behold, one like the Son of Man. We're going to look at this theme all the way through the weekend. When you think about clouds, you have to think about the Son of Man. One like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. Well, it's interesting, isn't it, that we, we've got one like, notice that, one like the Son of Man. And if you know anything about Daniel chapter 7, you've got a whole list of beasts, terrifying beasts there. And, and it's interesting, isn't it, the way that Daniel describes these beasts. Have a look at this. Verse 4, like a lion, like a bear, like a leopard. So there's an immediate contrast, one like the Son of Man, one like a lion, one like a bear, one like a leopard. So these three animals that we've looked at so far take on the attributes and characteristics of wild animals. But we have a fourth beast, and this fourth beast here is absolutely terrifying, and you can see that in verse 7. It's unlike any other of the animals that Daniel has witnessed. In fact, there's no other animal like it in the animal kingdom. But the next scene is altogether different. This is a man with the clouds of heaven. It's not terrifying. It's not like the four beasts that precede it. It's a picture that is comforting and uplifting. It's one that thrills Daniel. And brothers and sisters, young people, it's one that should thrill us. And there's so much in it. But before we look at that, I just want to notice some of the language. One like the Son of Man there in verse 13. Well, that prompts a thought, doesn't it? Because that's very similar to something that I'm sure we've all looked at in the past. Let's have a quick look at Daniel chapter 3. And you've got the fiery furnace, a well-known story. And, and you've got Nebuchadnezzar, and he sees, doesn't he? He's got Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah there in the fire, and he notices an unidentified fourth man. So Daniel 3, then, in verse 25, and the reason we're going there, just notice the similarity in the language. So these are the words of King Nebuchadnezzar. Lo, he says in verse 25, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. That's the point I want to make. So the one in the fiery furnace is one like the Son of God and here the one in heaven is one like the Son of Man. So there's a beautiful contrast that's being made. Here, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they're in the fiery furnace. And, and Nebuchadnezzar sees the appearance of a man. And this man is entirely divine. He's an angel. But Daniel, having this vision in heaven, he sees the appearance of a man also. But this man is altogether human. And this son of man here in verse 13 really resonates here in this chapter. If we look at this theme in a concordance, the son of man, the, the Hebrew there is Ben Adam. Ben Adam. And in the very name, it's taking us all the way back to Adam, the firstborn of God. And so it's telling us right away that this son of man, the Ben Adam, is a representative of mankind. He is of the line of Adam. He bears our nature, a human nature, tempted in all points as we are, yet, as we know, without sin. So this is the one we're looking at, and it's really important to, to kind of fuse those thoughts in our minds as we, we look at this one in heaven, this glorious man, but he's a son of man. If you, if you think about the son of man, I, I wonder what kind of things pop into your head. It's a wonderful thing. What I want to do, I just want to illustrate this. I want to look at Mark's gospel. You'll know, I'm sure, that Mark's gospel is a, a gospel that really emphasised the, the, the servitude of the Lord Jesus Christ as a servant of, of God. And I just want to um, look at the attributes and the characteristics of the Son of Man. Just in Mark's gospel, we don't need to turn them up. Just look at the phrases on the screen. And, and what you need to remember as we go through these verses is that all these qualities are sealed up. They're bound up in this man who stands in the presence of God in heaven. And it's because of these qualities he's there. So, the Son of Man in Mark 2 and verse 10 hath power on earth to forgive sins. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders, of the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, 
and after three days rise again. That's, that's Mark 8, verse 31. The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. That's something we'd all understand. That's Mark 10, verse 45. That the Son of Man is coming in the clouds with power and great glory. That's what we're talking about this weekend. That's Mark 13, verse 26. And then finally, the Son of Man is sitting. We're now seeing him standing. Mark says he goes beyond that point. He sits at the right hand of power. And he's going to come in the clouds of heaven. Mark 13, verse 26. Mark 14 and verse 62. So what we have here is an extraordinary man. A wonderful man. A a, a beautiful man. A great man. A powerful man. And brothers and sisters and young people, a man who loved us. A man who died for us, yet without sin. A man who was slain from the foundation of the world. And his love was so great that he receives now honor and praise and acclamation from God in heaven. That's the picture that's being painted. Brothers and sisters, we have to be moved by that. It's amazing. It's amazing that this meeting truly took place. I want to think a little more about the role of the Son of Man because we could think about Jesus here standing alone and he was in a certain sense, he was standing alone but there's something else that's going on and uh, to highlight that, let's have a look at Hebrews chapter 2 please. Hebrews chapter 2. And uh, the the point I want to make here is that Hebrews chapter 2 quotes from Psalm 8. And we're going to be looking at Psalm 8 a few times during the weekend. It's a real launching pad in thinking about the Son of Man. So Hebrews 2, the apostle here, quotes from Psalm 8. Let's just pick up then in verse 6. And you'll get a sense right away why we've gone here. Hebrews 2 verse 6. But one in a certain place testified, saying... What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man, notice, that thou visitest him? And think about Jesus in heaven now, in Daniel chapter 7, and look what the apostle writes. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, thou crownest him with glory and honour, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing. That is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus. Who was made a little lower than the angels. For the suffering of death. Crowned with glory and honour. That he by the grace of God. Should taste death for every man. And this is the. This is the, 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 the kind of the climax here. For it became him. For whom are all things. And by whom are all things. In bringing many sons unto glory. At least underline those words in your mind. Many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So if I were to ask you, what is the purpose? What is the role of the Son of Man? You've got the answer here in Hebrews 2 verse 10, that it was not for Jesus alone. His purpose in the role of the Son of Man was to bring many sons and daughters unto glory. We need to really remember that. The role of the Son of Man was to bring many sons and daughters unto glory. And and so then, in a way, the the Son of Man becomes the sons of men, doesn't it? That this man, the Lord Jesus Christ, represents a host. Uh, And who's the host? The host of Adam. He is the Ben Adam. And he's going to redeem a host. And he's going to change them. And they're going to become sons and daughters unto glory. The one will become a multitude. The the singular seed will become the multitudinous seed. We know this language. And here we have it, brothers and sisters. And this all happened then, this son of man, all happened for you and for me. There he is standing as a representative for a hidden multitude. For men, past present and future and he's going to redeem all of them by God's grace brothers and sisters this is amazing what he did amazing what he did there's a few other little details I want to highlight here 
I'm sure we've all got our thoughts about the captain of their salvation there in verse 10. But what I want to just draw your attention to is, is Vine's Dictionary. It's a good um, dictionary. I think you can buy it from the Christadelphian office. It's a good dictionary. And um, the translation there on the captain is one who goes first. I want you just to think about that. One who goes first. Just reflect upon that for a moment. What went first? Where did we start today? The ark went first. 2,000 cubits early. What else went first? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ ascended from the Mount of Olives 2,000 years later to when he's going to return to Jerusalem. And here we have the Lord Jesus Christ going first, being the first fruits of them that slept and a harvest. Sons and daughters would be brought to glory, would follow. Can you see that? This idea of the first. And that's what he's doing. He's ushering in a multitude. So in other words, then this is all about us, brothers and sisters, young people. This is all about us. And it's consistent language to Daniel 7. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 7. And you can see this, that the vision is so encompassing that, that we see here the many sons and daughters being brought to glory. Look at verse 18 of Daniel chapter 7. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. They're not the sons and daughters brought to glory that the, the writer of the Hebrews talks about. They're, they're the saints, but they're the same things, that the glorified ones. These are the sons and daughters to glory. But who are these saints? Think about it. Well, when we look at that, don't, don't just read it and accept it. Who are these saints? Well, these are the men and women who have been terrorized, tormented, and in many cases, killed by the lion and the bear and the leopard. And as Jesus stood in heaven, what was prevailing at the time? The menacing fourth beast, the Roman beast. And think about the Christians under Nero that died. And so Jesus, as he stood there in heaven, he thought about all these, past, present, and future. And they were all bound up with him. These are the sons and daughters to glory of Hebrews chapter 2. And it's so dramatic. It's so beautiful. I just want to try and illustrate this. That the Son of Man now reaches heaven and sat in his throne room is the Almighty. And he's described here as the Ancient of Days. I want you to look at verse 14 of Daniel chapter 7. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that will not be destroyed. And so picture it. Here is the, the son of man and he comes now to the ancient of days and something is going to be transferred from the ancient of days to the son of man. And what is it? It's a little... A phrase here, and, and it's something we shouldn't just overlook. Look, look at it. It says there, dominion, glory, and the kingdom. We're going to come across that phrase repeatedly through this weekend. So try and plant that in your head. Dominion, glory, and a kingdom. It's a triplet. As you can see on the screen, it's a triplet that runs all the way through the book of Daniel. And in every reference that we've got on the screen, at least two of the dominion, glory, and kingdom are mentioned in those verses. And so a rhetorical question is being asked as the reader reads the book of Daniel. And it's like, who is going to have dominion, glory, and kingdom? Is it going to be the kingdom of men or is it going to be the kingdom of God? And here in Daniel chapter 7, a resounding answer goes forth. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how dramatic it is. And it's handed over to the Lord Jesus Christ. And just notice here, carefully, how this authority is granted. You can look at verse 13. It's kind of an exercise of filling in the gaps. Daniel 7, verse 13, it says, They, and the word they there is referring to the clouds. The clouds brought him, who? The Son of Man, near before him. Who? The Ancient of Days. So the clouds 
brought the Son of Man near the Ancient of Days. And you can see in verse 13 that it was the clouds that took the Son of Man to the Ancient of Days. And look at the phrase that's used there, brought him near before him. You might have other translations. They could go something like this. He was led into his presence or he was escorted. Just just think about that. That the clouds here were leading and escorting. Well, natural clouds don't do that, do they? They they don't welcome someone in Acts chapter 1. And they certainly don't escort someone who sat upon the throne. This is talking about something else, isn't it? This is the cloud of angels. It's the very same cloud of angels that took Jesus up into heaven in Acts chapter 1. And it's breathtaking. It is so moving, isn't it? But what's missing in all of this? Detail. You would imagine with this build-up that we'd have a a lovely scene that's described for us of what Almighty God said to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, but nothing. Why? It was a private moment. It was an intimate moment between the father and son. Cast your minds back to the resurrection morning. What was said between the father and son? We can only allude to from the from the Psalms, can't we? It was between the Father and Son and them alone. Isn't it lovely? And what a moment it was. But why is it that the angels, a host of angels, took the Lord Jesus Christ into heaven? Just, just ask yourselves that question. Why didn't the Lord Jesus Christ ascend on his own? Why did it need a, a host of angels? Well, these angels live in the presence of God, don't they? They live in heaven, and just as Jacob's ladder describes them, ascending and descending, so do these angels. And Jesus had never been to heaven before, had he? He didn't know the route. And so these angels, they celebrated the fact that one had overcome, and for the first time ever, They were taking someone home with them. They were taking the Lord Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son. And they could not be happier, could they? I want to have a look at Psalm 104. Let's have a a quick look at Psalm 104. It's going to be our, our last reference here. And the reason why we're going here is that this psalm, I believe, builds on the picture of Christ going in clouds to his heavenly Father. A picture of Acts chapter 1, a picture of Daniel chapter 7. Let's just see what we find here. I'm just going to read the words carefully. Um, it's lovely poetic language that's expressed in this psalm. Psalm 104, then in verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my God, or, O my soul, O Lord my God, thou art very great, thou art clothed with honour and majesty, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment, who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain, who layest the beams of his chambers in the waters, who makest the clouds his chariots, who walketh upon the wings of the wind, who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. Lovely words, aren't they? Look, look at verse 3, the clouds there. They are associated with God's chariot. And so Jesus was brought to heaven in God's own personal chariot. Jesus travelled in God's special vehicle with God's angels. And look at verse 4. Who maketh his angels spirits. You may have something slightly different in your Bible. The revised version margin certainly says these words. His angel winds. So in other words, then, God made the angels like wind, mighty and swift and invisible in doing God's work and fulfilling God's purpose. And so we then have the clouds as God's chariot, the angels as his wind, and we have the figure of angels powering the cloud chariot of God. Which is exactly what we see in Daniel chapter 7. Like a turbine driving the chariots, the cloud chariot 
to heaven. Brothers and sisters, isn't that just lovely? So moving, isn't it? So can you imagine such a moment? The father and son laying eyes upon each other in the flesh for the first time. No father has ever loved a son like God loved his. And no son has earned the love and the respect of a father like the Lord Jesus Christ. And now in this eternal state, they stand there in the courtroom, led by a great host of angels. This scene is utterly amazing, isn't it? And just cast your eyes around that room and you can see a host of angels and they're all, they're all smiling, aren't they? They are all savouring the moment. This is a moment that they have waited for, for eternity. And now it has arrived and the room is filled with, with excitement of what is about to take place. And as the angels now present the Lord Jesus Christ, almighty God. Did Jesus bow in reverence of the sovereignty of the one who sat upon the throne? And then did he rush over and embrace his father as a father and son? Or was it that as soon as Jesus was presented by the angels, the father got up from his throne and raced to his son. For many of us, we have families this weekend, and this is an emotional moment between the father and son. And it would have moved everyone. And brothers and sisters and young people, if there's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents, what kind of rejoicing took place this day? It must have been wild celebration as the angels applauded after the private moment between the father and son. But what were they celebrating? That they weren't merely celebrating what had been done, what had been achieved, what had been accomplished. They rejoiced in a sure future because this son of man would become A multitude of men and women redeemed from Adam's line. And they rejoiced in that knowledge. As soon as it happened, the kingdom of God was guaranteed. It was a surety. Jesus Christ enthroned in Jerusalem was sure. Many sons would be brought to glory. Brothers and sisters, young people, what a privilege we have to come here this weekend. And whatever problems, concerns, anxieties, difficulties that you're facing in life, however low and broken and shattered, and you might even be feeling it's so difficult to even continue, and you've brought yourself here just so that a spark possibly could happen, please, please think about that heavenly meeting and what it meant to God, his son and a host of angels. And the plans now are prepared. Jesus now is ready and he's coming. He's coming in clouds to establish God's kingdom. And he wants on that day many sons and many daughters and he promises us that we will be brought to glory. What a comfort. This is our hope.